All right, welcome to session four of a sports betting education. I'm your host, professional sports better Eric Waz from Better IQ. We're going to go ahead and continue our discussion of the various ways to create an edge tonight. Uh, we're going to take it right up until the NFL draft at five o'clock Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern. Uh, sports betting legend and good friend of mine, Dinkinson, will join us here in a little bit, which I'm really excited for. I uh, first want to mention our campaign here before we get started, Sports Betters Supporting COVID-19 Healthcare Heroes. Uh, there's a link to donate on our course page at betteriq.com. Highly encourage you to do that at some point during this course. We've had some really, really generous donations so far. So I thank everyone for the support. Please keep it going. If you didn't get a chance to listen to our first three sessions, they're all on YouTube right now. Just type in Better IQ on YouTube and you'll find each of them. Uh, they kind of build up as you go. So if you've missed something, I, I encourage you to listen to it as soon as you can, just so you build on those building blocks from the earlier sessions. If you do have any questions throughout the class, there's a Q&A button at the very bottom of the Zoom, uh, uh, bottom of the template there, you can see it. So you click on that, ask a question. I won't look at those until probably the last five or 10 minutes. We could do as many as we can. And then uh, the rest of those I can answer on Twitter, hopefully the next, the next morning. So last session, we talked about what an edge is in the sports betting market uh, and then how to choose the right betting markets to participate in. And then we got into power ratings a little bit uh, with Captain Jack. And I want to kind of pick that up here. We didn't get through all of it uh, for the first about 15 minutes here. And then we'll, we'll bring in uh, Dink to talk about his approach a little bit. And we'll talk about making a line as well and kind of how you make adjustments to kind of get to the ultimate number. So I introduced power ratings and, you know, we're going to kind of dive into that some more here. Um, I want to get more into like the fine tuning of the range. We talked last week about or last session about, you know, using point differentials and some very generic metrics you can use to kind of get started. But that's obviously not going to be good enough to beat the market. And you have to do a lot more than that. So you obviously need to latch on some metrics for each sport that are predictive. If you want to take it one step further, we'll go, we'll go into it in a minute about you know, creating some of your own ratings, combining some elements and things like that. So I want to shift to basketball. We have talked a lot about basketball so far. I've talked a lot about football and some other sports, baseball a little bit uh, with other guests. So in basketball, a really good starting point is the efficiency ratings. So you have defensive efficiency, offensive efficiency, and you've got the pace ratings. And you can actually compute a pretty good accurate line using just those three things alone. Um, it, it depends how you use them, but if you just want to take the efficiencies and the pace, you can, I can kind of show you guys, maybe I'll do like a little video over the weekend that, that goes through all the calculations. It's really not that hard to get you a line on a game. Um, the key is how you make the adjustments to those efficiency ratings, because they're not going to, again, be good enough to beat the market. You got to make your own adjustments to offense, defense, pace, and, you know, combine those to make it a, a stronger, more predictive, uh, formula. So. In football, really, yards per play is kind of the, the barometer a lot of guys use. We talked about that last last session a little bit. You can have an adjusted yards per play you use that, that is going to be better than the markets. Um, and then use kind of a, a plays per game kind of pace to figure out how many possessions there'll be in a game on average and how many plays they'll be able to get in and kind of take that one step further to compute a projected score. So I can do that again over the weekend. I'll put together maybe a short video on how to do the basic calculations. So you want to look at stats and metrics, obviously, that, that are very predictive. But on top of that, to take it one step further, you want to look at some stats that people aren't looking at. Um, and I think, you know, we can use a sport like maybe like baseball. Um, we'll talk when, when Dink gets on a little bit about baseball and hockey. Um, but looking at some of the, the metrics, you know, maybe like for starting pitchers, velocity or spin rate, things that are definitely predictive of how well a pitcher is pitching how effective he can be. And, you know, obviously runs scored and runs allowed is kind of what determines a winner in baseball. So when you get kind of granular, look, you know, several layers deeper, you're going to look at those things like velocity, like spin rate, and try to normalize those to say, okay, what is a normal, uh, an average kind of for those ratings for that pitcher? So, you know, what's its average velocity, its average spin rate? That way you can kind of gauge, you know, any point in time is he, if he's better or worse than what he usually is. And that'll tell you a lot about, his performance. It might not be what his actual numbers come out to, but it'll give you at least a baseline of what to expect when he's at different numbers. Uh, so we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. Um, charting is another way. 
we'll talk we'll talk with Dink about this too. When, you, when you're charting, you know, looking at games from from day to day, looking at box scores, play by play logs, reading recaps, watching some games. That's another approach that kind of more the traditional old school, you know, not using a model necessarily, maybe using a, a mental model or have a process. If you're not using the algorithm, um, you know, not using any kind of software or any kind of program to compute a rating. You're doing it more manually from day to day. I think there's a lot of elements that that modelers miss not doing it that way. And then the flip side, there's things that the traditional guys who do it, you know, day by day manually, they missed because they're not using a model. So there is definitely some pros and cons to each approach. Uh, but I think the non-modeling approach that we'll talk through tonight is probably going to resonate better with a lot more of you that, that don't have maybe the technical skills or haven't learned them yet how to build like a model using you know regression analysis and figuring out exactly how much things are worth. This approach tonight will be a little bit simpler. It's not any less um, you know effort, and to be honest, it's probably more effort doing it you know the more traditional way. I feel like, but um, it just depends on who you are and how you want to approach things. So um, the other thing with power ratings too is that we are talking about basketball and football. They're a little more, uh, they're a little simpler. We, we want to calculate a point spread to subtract one from the other. It's really not that way for money line sports are different. Uh, you can't just take a, a money line, subtract another money line. It's not going to get you the right answer. You need to convert them into probabilities uh, to really get an apples to apples comparison. So if you have a 500 team, you know, an average team in, in let's say baseball, you know, you can say, okay, they have a 500 winning percentage. You can make that like a 50 rating in your in your rating scale. And like I told you before, rating scale doesn't matter all that much. Um, and then a 60% win rate could be a 60 rating and so on. So you can have everywhere ever in between or lower than that. The key is when you take those, those power ratings, you got to convert them back into a probability first to figure out what the line of the game should be. You can't just subtract them. Like I said, for football and basketball, it's very easy. You just subtract the two. You've got your point spread. It's a little more compli complicated than that. And I'll, I'll share that in this extra video I do over the weekend to kind of get you the math on. It's not hard. It's just got a matter of getting it down, converting a money line power rating into an actual probability of winning the game, which we can turn into a money line. So you can compare that to the market to see if there's a value there or not. But I think the biggest challenge in, in, in power ratings is kind of maintaining them day to day. It's really a grind. Uh, you can't skip days. You can't take days off. If you do, you'll miss information. You'll miss data that's really important. So when you have a model, obviously you can automate that process. But when you're doing it manually, it's a lot more work, I feel like. It's a lot more effort. Uh, but you do find some subjective elements you'll probably miss if you're doing it with a model. So um, there's certain questions I think you should be asking yourself when you're adjusting the power ratings. Um, the big question is, you know, did the team, did the teams you're, in the game you're looking at, did the teams exceed expectations, underperform, underperform expectations based on what you thought they should be doing in that game? And it's not as simple as just looking at the final score. You know, it's usually the underlying metrics to tell you more about what actually happened in the game, especially for a sport like hockey or baseball. You can dominate the game and still lose the game. So you're not looking at scores as often in those in those sports, whereas basketball, it's a little more score focused. Football, somewhere in the middle. Uh, but hockey and baseball, again, you can absolutely dominate the game and lose it just depending on one player, you know, shutting that team down. Where a goalie in hockey can shut down 46 shots, not allow anything to get past him. In baseball, a starting pitcher could get totally, you know, he could, he could be totally off his game. He give up a lot of hits, but they don't lead to any runs for some reason. They just strain a lot of runners or hit into a lot of double plays. So, again, the score is not the best gauge. You want to look at the underlying stats to see what actually happened in that game and make your adjustments that way. We'll go through an example here when we get Allen on here. Um, the other thing you want to look at, is there any – outliers in the game, like an injury that happened or something that maybe is unforeseen that you didn't anticipate before the game that might have impacted the game. That's where kind of reading the game recaps are really important because you're going to miss a lot of that kind of stuff if you don't watch the game or if you don't, if you just look at the box score, maybe you missed certain things like that. There could be an injury. There could be something significant that happened that just changed the whole complexion of the game. That's, again, you'll get that in a recap. Um, but what you're ultimately boiling it down to is you want to see how much luck was there involved in the game? How much luck played a role in the game? And there's a lot of misleading final scores in a lot of these games where the, the, the scores don't really tell you what's really happening. I'd say probably like 80% of games, the score isn't really accurate. It's close in a lot of cases, but I'm always making adjustments to every final score to come up with an adjusted score that I think is more accurate. Uh, it comes down to that signal and the noise again from, we talked about last uh, Tuesday with, with Captain Jack that 
you know, the, the noise is the score sometimes. It's, it's the signals more than underlying stats that tell you what actually happened. And the score could be kind of noisy, especially in a sport like hockey. Um, I'd say earlier in the season, you want to be a little more aggressive in updating your power ratings uh, because you have more uncertainty at the beginning of the year than you do at the end. So by the time you get halfway through the season, your adjustments are probably much smaller on the teams from week to week or day to day. Whereas in the beginning of the year, when you just have a lot of new players and be a new coach, different circumstances, different chemistry with the team, I think you have to be a little more aggressive. Um, if you're not, I think you're going to probably miss things. And if you're not proactive, you're going to find out that the market's probably ahead of you. So don't be afraid to take some big leaps and make some big adjustments to your power ratings early on. You have to be careful not to make too big of adjustments, obviously. You don't want to overreact on one result. When you start getting a couple of games in, you've got to get proactive and say, hey, this team is actually different than what I thought, different than what the market thought, different than what they were last year. And the sooner you make those adjustments, the better. Again, it's a delicate balance between not overreacting, but also reacting enough and getting ahead of the market a little bit. Um, don't fall into the narrative traps. You hear a lot of narratives about, you know, teams that, that beat writers or, you know, studio analysts will start, you know, saying, hey, this team is, um, you know, they look great. The chemistry is great. This coach is making all these changes. I mean, they might, whatever it is, they're talking up. I mean, you got to be careful. Let the numbers do more of the talking. Um, obviously, reading and getting information is good, but the numbers should lead the way. So keep that in mind at all times, that the numbers should be backing up what you think. If you think a narrative is real, Look at the numbers and make sure it's real. Make sure it's something that's really happening. Another big thing, and we'll talk about, about this in a little bit too, is, is current form. Like how much do you adjust your ratings based on how a team's playing right now versus what they were for the entire season? You can look at that in two different ways. You know, in a sport like baseball, you might say, well, game to game, you know, every game's different, you have different pitchers, different lineups. Is there momentum or is there things happening? Are guys hot to play? Does that adjust, you know, does that make a difference in the, the current game or not? Um, it's different by sport. We'll get into that a little bit. I think NBA and NHL current form matters a lot. How you're playing right now is definitely more important than how you've played for the whole season. I think NFL less so, and I think MLB a little bit less so. So we can get into that a little bit more, but definitely want to consider how the team is playing now. If you just look at the full season, you know, and treat each game the same, you're going to run some huge problems in certain sports. Um, the other thing you could do is a, a sanity check with your rating, your power ratings against what the market has. You can kind of back into what the power ratings that the books are using and the betting markets are using just by looking at, you know, where the game closed and then just taking those point spreads or money lines and comparing them to yours and figuring out where you have the biggest deltas. Where's, where's your rating the, the biggest off from the books or the betting markets? Not to say it's wrong. You don't want to just immediately adjust your, you know, your power rating because the market's got a lot different number than you do. You might be totally right, but you at least want to know where you're off the most because that might lead you to investigate a little bit more and say, hey, am I missing something there? Um, and usually if it's off by a, a fair margin, you're missing something in the market. So I encourage you, you know, once you get comfortable making your own ratings to, to cross check them against the market just to see, you know, you investigate and find a few things that, that maybe you tweak your ratings a little bit. Um, I regress my ratings a little bit to the market because I know my errors are probably bigger than they should be. So I will take a certain percentage of my my weight goes into the market. So I'm always going to be a little closer to the market than um, my, my raw ratings are. So, so keep that in mind as well. Um, one other thing I want to talk about too with power ratings is you're not going to have the same level of comfort with every power rating you make. You might struggle to make certain teams power ratings. You might, be, you might feel really good about, you know, four of the five teams in a division, but that fifth team, you're really having a hard time pinpointing are they going to be better or worse? Or there's just a bigger distribution of outcomes, let's say, for whatever reason. It could be a lot of new players. It could be a new coach. It could be just you don't have a good feel for it. What I like to do with my ratings is I like to put a grade next to each rating so I know how strongly I feel about that rating. And I kind of go, you know, my power ratings are all numbers, obviously. My grades on the power ratings are letters, so I don't get them confused. So I have like an A, B, C, D, F, just like you get graded in school where I'll put next to the power rating to say, hey, if, if I feel really good about the rating, I feel like it's, this is, you know, I know it really well. I, I don't think it's going to deviate from this rating. I'm pretty comfortable with this. I'm very confident it's not going to change. I make I put an A next to it. If I'm very unsure, very uncertain about a team, have no idea, I got a number out there, but I don't think it's a good number, that's an F. And then I know when I get a game matchup coming, if I have two teams playing one another and I, I detect an edge in that game based on my numbers versus the market, and both teams are an A, then I feel pretty good I have an edge in there because I'm very confident in both the team's ratings. 
and I don't feel like I need to make any kind of adjustment. I can go ahead and bet that game. But if I have a game where I have like a, you know, the two, 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 two teams are like a D and an F playing one another, and I have a big error there, not error, but the difference between me and the market, I'm probably less excited about betting that. Maybe I bet smaller, maybe I don't bet at all because I, I don't feel good about either team, even though I'm saying, hey, I have an edge here. It's probably less of an edge than I think, or maybe no edge at all. So that's one element that I use that um, I would highly encourage doing once you get well into the power rating, you know, process and you feel start feeling better about things, just just put a letter grade for a while. And I usually, halfway through the season, I kind of get rid of those because you get to a point where they're all becoming A's or B's and it's really not adding a lot of value. But early on in the season, that first month or two, that's huge for me because I, if I get a lot of D's and F's, you know, I'm going to stay away from those games or at least bet smaller because I'm not as comfortable. All right, so I think now's a good time to bring in uh, Alan Dinkinson, professional sports better. He's been betting professionally for over 40 years, most of his career. Uh, Dink, how you doing? Welcome to Sports Better good. Education. Can you hear me good, Eric? Yeah, you, you sound good. How, how, how's it going? Uh, well, I'm going, it's going okay. It's a little tougher by myself. During yeah. The, the, how are you holding up with the, with the virus and everything? I mean, um, indoors? Most days are good. Some days I get a little bored and start reading too much about it the virus and watching too many politicians talk about it. <laughs> yeah, you got to be good. I'm always <laughs> like to know where I'm heading and we have no idea where we're heading and that's hard. No, we're totally in the dark. So I, I try to, I definitely have to unplug from it a little bit and, you know, stop reading, stop watching stuff on TV and, you know, focus on sports betting a little bit and try to get my mind <laughs> off of it. But let's, let's tell everybody a little bit about your background. I know you've been betting professionally for Ever, over 40 years, haven't had a, a regular job. This has been your job for the most of your life. And um, you also were portrayed in a movie, Lay the Favorite by Bruce Willis, who played you in the movie, which was kind of a cool experience. So tell everybody about, about your background a little bit and maybe about Lay the Favorite, how that, how that came about. Well, grew up in New York. Uh, started going to the racetrack around 15 with some of the older kids who had cars. Um, got a quarter sheet from a bookmaker that there, so my friends were betting with him and I was getting a free roll on their losses. They kept losing, so I took over my own, my own quarter sheet and ran my own bookie business for a little while. Went broke at around 24 when the wise guys found their way into my office and I, I no longer could have put up any line I wanted because people would just bet whatever the favorite was. And it became a lot of, it was a learning experience. Bailed myself out by hard work. Um, got arrested, became a better after I went to school for 11 months. And when they let me out of school, I moved to Vegas, um, became a better, learned a lot of lessons that way too. It took a little while for me to adjust. I thought I knew a lot because I had some of the sharpest people betting with me, but it turned out I didn't have it all figured out right away and gradually got better at that too kept going. Uh, the movie came about when I hired one of my clerks, people who were at casinos for me or calling rundowns before Don Best was, you know, very popular when you had to call some offices offshore and continue to get rundowns. And when it was time to make a bet, you know, who has seven on this game and the four people in the office wanted them might have it and I go, okay, take the seven. Um, then I hired Beth Raymer, who became like my little sister, and she left and went to New York, got married, also worked in Curacao for a while with um, ASAP, and then went to Columbia University. Somehow she got in there. She's very, very smart about beating the system because she didn't have the grades, but she had a unique approach, and they liked unique approach. So she got into Columbia, uh, wanted to be a writer. She said, I'm going to write a book about working for you and working for um, my friend Robbie in New York and then in uh, Curacao. And I said, don't do that. Nobody's going to read it. And she <laughs> listened because she never listens. And she was right. She's usually right. Uh, and the book was great, by the way. The book was amazing. Yeah, the book was great. The movie. Awesome. The movie was rushed because it was bought by an indie guy and he sold it quickly to somebody else when he got all these great actors and director. Stephen Frears was the director. So my reputation, he sold it and made like 
quick turnover of three million, and then it's up to him to put money into the movie to make it good. He put nothing into the movie. They shot it in 30 days. It was rushed. It wasn't good. It, it, the movie turned out to be pretty bad, but before the movie, it was really bad the first time they had to make some improvements on it. Um, who were some of the cast? Who was yeah. well as played you, but who were some of the other cast? Who well played me? Um, I my, my wife, who was Tulip in the movie, was Catherine Zeta Jones. I tell people I, I was married once to Catherine Zeta Jones, <laughs> even though she didn't know she was married to me. Rebecca Hall, who was one of the nicest people ever, played Beth. And played her, I like Beth, and I think that got the movie into a little trouble because the character was so over the top. But if you knew Beth, it was actually maybe a little understated. Um, Vince Vaughn played Robbie, the Curacao bookmaker. Um, and Jay, oh God, I forgot his name. It was a soap opera guy played Jeremy, which is Beth's husband. It's a great cast. I mean, a lot of big names in there. It was a great cast. Yeah, it was an honor to, play, to be played by Bruce. He was very, very nice to me and my wife. Um, total gentleman. People said he fought to work with, but, but you know, we kept in touch for a little while after the movie. And he was a good guy. He, he was, you know, a New York. He's a Jersey guy. He's a New York bartender for a while. So I think we related a little that way. The, the funny story is the first time we met was right before the movie started. He wanted to meet me for dinner. And he kept his wife on the other side of the table away from us in case I was a total jerk. And so we got along and he called his wife over and, and he, yeah, she was really nice too. That was his second wife, uh, Emma. Okay. Was his first. And then you were also featured in a documentary, The Best of It, with Alan I Bonson. got lucky there too. Um, Scott Eberly worked at TVG and I knew some people at TVG. So he reached out and said, you want to be a character in a documentary I'm shooting? And, we got along well. He's a really good guy. We still talk. Um, that was really well done. I mean, I thought that was yeah. Really everybody liked that one. Everybody liked that one. Unfortunately, it didn't make it into, you know much money, but it made some money. And it wasn't a failure. And it's kind of a niche movie, a niche documentary about gamblers. And I thought it was well done. I thought you know I was a little off the. Um, I was I was the most sane by elimination. You know. <laughs> Alan Boston, Len, Bank, Len Banker, and The Shrink. Um, and the movie takes a, a dark turn at the end. It was good. It was good. You learn a lot about gambling. You learn about it's, it's a frustrating, hard job. And that's what it's become. It wasn't always like that. But now gambling's a lot of work. There are a lot of smart people like you and Rufus and Spanky and Captain Jack and, and a lot of my competition is so much more educated than me when I first started just because I was a college educated person with a degree in accounting and a bunch of statistics classes. I was in the upper echelon of knowledgeable applications for most gamblers were just gamblers looking who couldn't make it anywhere else and bookmakers didn't really work that hard because most of their customers were betting favorites and not winning. So I, I came in at a good time to be a better. Um, uh, even a better time to be a bookmaker because there weren't that many shop people but it, that turned around with the computer group and Billy Walters and Stevie Z and all, all the people who ended up betting with me and you know I was like hey six years ago I, I didn't have any customer who had a winning for six years I never had a customer who won and now I have this influx of like 15 customers who win every week and um, I have to change my ways and respect the betters more We've made it this, I mean, you've been doing this your entire career. I mean, 40 plus years of betting on sports. That's a pretty, it's a pretty awesome achievement. I mean, that's. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's, let's that was my biggest mistake. I didn't take advantage when times were good and now times are different. Yeah. Uh, well, I can I'd grind out a living now. And that's all I can do with a lot of work. Yeah. Well, you still do pretty well. I mean, you're still handicapping. You're still, you're still sharp mentally. You look, I mean, I mean, you're, you're doing fine. You're doing absolutely okay. fine. So let's, let's try to learn from you a little bit, kind of how you do things. So obviously you said you handicap NHL and MLB primarily right now. Would you say that's accurate, right? Very accurate. Probably 100% of my handicapping is in those two sports. Okay. Not 100% of my betting because I'll follow market moves or talk right. to some people, trade information. You know, I follow you sometimes. You follow me sometimes. Right, right. And, and those are money line sports, obviously. So those are a little trickier, I think, from a power rating standpoint. You can't just subtract them and get a point spread kind of thing. You got to be a little more creative with that. So let's let's kind of talk about your approach. So 
we talked about charting earlier and how, you know, looking at box scores, recaps, watching games, you're kind of doing all those things to kind of, you know, bake them all into your, your model, so to speak, your mental model of doing things. Yeah, that's what it is, a mental model. Everybody, you know, I tell everybody I can't model, but you do, you know, everything is worth something in your mind and that is where the line goes. You saw with the two teams being even and then you leave the even as this is a better team, the other team has injuries, the other team is tired, my team is fresh, what are all those worth? Stop with minus 20 is your break even point and then you go, well, now it's like minus 80. Or, and then you go, well, they're playing the Red Wings, the worst team in hockey right now, and my team is uh, the, the Golden Knights. It was on a good run. So maybe I could be up to like 280, 320 or something on those kind of games. And you, you just think about it in your mind and put in a range where you won't bet if that's the line. And uh, the past a lot of games might find some more value in totals. Injuries are really important. They, To me, at least, injuries are really important. They change your power rating. If, if McDavid's been out for a month, Edmonton automatically gets a huge bump when he comes back and has a huge regression when he was out. You have to figure out how much that's worth in terms of sense. Is, you know, is a 30-cent injury? Is it a 20-cent injury? Do they overrate the injuries, the bookmakers, or do they underrate the injuries? Are there cluster injuries? Are three players out? Are all the lines different tonight because there's a player out from the number one, two, and three line, and they have to move up players on from the fourth line to fill those spots? That's hard. It's hard to play with people in hockey who you haven't played with for a while. There's little gimmicks like that. I'm, I kind of like gimmicks like, you know, this team is playing their third game in four nights and they traveled the last two days. Yeah. Oh, before we get into all the different situational stuff, okay, right? sure. let's talk about just pure powering. So what are you looking for? Let's say everybody's healthy and it's a normal situation and you're looking at a box score, play-by-play, -play, watching games. What kind of elements are you looking for from a team to start making adjustments up or down for that team? Expect the goals, uh, Corsi, um, score-related, everything score-related in Corsi. If you're up 4 nothing, the third period, you're going to give back some probably Corsi numbers because you're protecting and not allowing good shots, but you end up allowing shots. I, I don't know if you want me to explain what Corsi is, but it's more yeah, based. Sure. It's a shot-based statistic. Like, it doesn't matter how many shots you take. It, matters, it doesn't matter how, where your shots are. It's a matter of how many shots you take. Not my favorite stat. Also, if you're up for nothing, I would bet on the team with zero would have more shots on goal in the th third period. I would bet that very high. Doesn't mean they're going to score, because you're limiting them to bad shots, but you're not risking your players trying to get down close to get good shots because you don't want them to come back and score on you if that fails. So you're playing a more conservative approach, and of course you will suffer. So games that are 2-2 two -two throughout the game, 1-1 one -one always tied, always close, those, those course numbers matter more than uh, – or the first period might matter in one game. That's 2 nothing at the end of the first period, becomes 3 nothing right away, and then you throw the course numbers. How do you balance what you see, like in the box score, looking at the analytics and the me different metrics that matter in hockey against what you're watching? Because I know you watch a lot of hockey games. How do you balance the two? I, I usually think what I see is going to be very related to the box score, I hope. Um, I, I say hockey, 30% of the games are won by the team with, who played worse, you know, get a worse rate. I grade everything, one to 10 or A, a minus, B plus, you know, teacher way. Um, so I always have these grades, and they're based on expectation. They're not based on final score. So if a good team's playing a bad team and the line is 90 and a good team wins 2-1, I can see the bad team getting a B-minus and the good team getting a C-plus because they didn't dominate the game. They were kind of fortunate to win. Maybe the game seemed evenish. They were supposed to be better than evenish. So you have an idea going into each game what to expect, and then you're yeah. You can do that by the closing line and be safe about it, or you can do that by your line and be safe about it. They should be close to each other. So you know, if Edmonton is playing Detroit, and Edmonton and Detroit played the big day before in Calgary, I would expect Edmonton to be noticeably better than Detroit. And you can get a game where Edmonton's up three nothing right away, and Detroit comes back and scores and gets some more shots late. But you have to know to kind of throw that out. So. In that game, I would probably give Edmonton a B or a B minus in Detroit a C or a C plus. So those grades, and I'm a big recent guy. I, I don't care what happened in October and in April. It means zero to me. 
the best example ever was in January last year, the Blues were in last place. They won the Stanley Cup. Right. So, um, so, so you can tell. Was everything. The last, how many games do you go back for current form? You're looking at 10 games, five games? I mean, um, maybe like two weeks. You know, I don't know how many games you're going to play in those two weeks. The schedule is always not balanced. And some teams get a week off. And, you know, which games use the backup goal? You're not supposed to do as well if your backup goal is different than your, your regular goal. You're not supposed to do well if you travel a lot and you're tired. You're not supposed to do as well if you're playing your third game in four nights. You know, there's a whole lot of things. And then you have an injury or two, a new injury, or they have somebody coming back, and they, that, that gives them a little a, a more of an expectation. So a lot of it is based on the little bit of chicken soup that you're making with it and you're stirring the soup and you're adding a little ingredients in to get your final line. Advantages, disadvantages, they balance out. Does one team have a bigger advantage? Um, how is the market? The teams that I always try to bet more against teams that are winning and you know recently winning but not playing that well rated in my ratings and on teams that have been recently losing but playing better than they look. That's what I'm looking for. So kind of then, like a, a horse that ran a good race but ran fifth because he had to go wide. A horse cut him off. He was in trouble in the stretch. You're looking for things that make the result worse or better than it really appears. I so, think the, the big three, like in hockey, and this is similar in basketball as well, NBA, are like injuries, travel, and rest, right? I mean, those, those are going to deviate from game to game. They're going to be different for every team. Everybody's in a different situation from night to night. Do you think that the betting markets do a good job of taking those three things into account? Or do you think your, most of your edge comes from valuing those things differently than what the betting markets value them? I think they're okay. I, I mean, the betting market's tougher now than it was before. They, when I started betting hockey, which I was betting when I was bookmaking, I would have two girls, one, on the, one in Vancouver and one in New York City, go to out-of-town newspapers thing. You know, stands and read me the articles from the out of town newspaper, which was a day old, but it was so much more informative. You can get injuries that, you know, a really good player has the flu. Nobody knows that. Nobody has it on the line. Don Best didn't exist. It didn't come up. Computers didn't exist. Nobody can go on a website and go, oh, look, there's no, there's no Gretzky today. You know, You're aging like, yourself now. <laughs> I'm 66. And, you know, once you say I've been betting for 40 years, you're aging me right then and there. So. You're right. I gave it away. <laughs> yeah. So it's no sign. I wasn't betting when I was three, and I'm not 43. So, yeah. <laughs> so kind of a, I finally reached the dinosaur level that, uh, that people talk about. So injuries is obviously a huge one for every sport because I think injuries, I mentioned this before, they don't get, I don't think, enough attention. I mean, everybody's aware of them, but I don't think people really sit there and think about what a guy's worth and put it into context a little bit. Because a lot of guys, you know, in the NBA, for instance, the big name players sometimes get adjusted way too big. And some of the lesser known names, guys that only play defense or one-way players, there's no adjustment at all, but they're going to affect the total at least and, and maybe even the side. Do you think hockey and baseball are that way where the injuries are maybe not given enough credit in certain cases, in some cases? Lineups are really important in baseball. Um, you know, I'm, I was going to, I want, I wrote this down that if you're doing power ratings in baseball, you should almost have two sets against the lefty and against the righty because mm -hmm. teams could be really different about those. Um, that was a little trick pointer that maybe people haven't thought about. It makes it a little harder because you kind of keep adjusting different power ratings every night. Um, the lineups are really important in baseball. Injuries are huge in hockey. I think that's my number one priority is injuries over rest, you know. Also, teams get the bump when players come back. So you're not always looking for injuries. You're looking for this is a second or third game back from an injury. So you might have been a little rusty if the injury was like two or three weeks from the first game. Uh, that team should get a little bump. One of the big ones that I like, and, and this pertains to just about every sport, is like a style of play change. So a team all of a sudden starts playing differently than they played the rest of the season. Maybe it's a coaching philosophy change. Maybe it's a a player like in hockey, they're switching guys on lines or playing on different lines they did before. Just little subtle adjustments that sometimes lead to like a big difference on the ice or on the field. I mean, do you see that being a big factor for you? Um, yeah, and teams will change to, you know, go into a trap, look, look to protect their goalie more. Um, you'll see that 
a team that's losing will look to change things and a team that's winning won't. So you're looking for changes in a team that's losing um, and, and that pace, you know, it's more in basketball. You know, we're going to slow down. We're going to pick things up. And, and, and in hockey, you, they'll say things, but a lot of times the teams play the same because that's how they practice and that's what they do. The lines just can't all, the, the first line can't all go into a rush mode. But they, they may be gambling a little bit more, checking, you know, forechecking a little stronger. Uh, and so they'll, they'll create more goals for themselves but give back some opportunities. So you'll be looking for that. Will the team be sending their players in to, to take the puck in the offensive zone or will they be lagging back? It's also score-based. If they're up 3 nothing, they're not going to be forechecking like crazy. They just don't want to give any opportunity. But when the Golden Knights their first year, they people said they worked harder than any other team, but that was because they were forechecking more than any other team. And they, the system was so good that they were creating opportunities for themselves better than their, their lineup or their supposed-to-be expected goals before a game. And they just kept getting better and better. But now teams have kind of figured that out, so then a lot more teams are playing the Golden Knights style from two years ago. What about, like, team chemistry? I mean, a lot of people kind of poo-poo it, say, hey, you know, the numbers are the numbers. It doesn't matter. But how well teammates get along, off the ice, off the field? Does that kind of stuff play into the handicap a little bit sometimes? I don't read too much about that. You know, um, Carlson, when he was on uh, um, Ottawa, had trouble with, with another married couple or something. I don't know. They, they laughed. They were still bad. I mean, they were bad and they didn't get better when, when they resolved that problem by making a trade. Um, I don't know. It, it Maybe in basketball more with passing is high. I, it doesn't seem, that's nothing I really look at, like how they get along in the locker room. But chemistry and hockey, you know, you can see a team click. You can see the Blues got much better in January last year. And that was a coaching change mostly. But there was a reason for it. But they clicked, and confidence is very important in all sports, in every single sport. When you go into a batting slump and you lose your confidence, you try to make changes, and it gets worse and worse. It takes a while to get your confidence back. So sticking with adjustments here, what about motivation? Motivation, like a spot where a team – I don't want – you know, everybody thinks of revenge right away. There's a lot more than that. There's, you know, looking ahead to the next game. There's – you know, special game for, for a certain player for whatever reason. Maybe it's a pitcher going for, like, his 100th win or just something that's a little different than your normal circumstance. Maybe a team's a little bit more motivated. Does that play in your handicap, or do you think that's way overrated for the most part? I don't know if it's overrated because it's not really rated that much. Um, one thing I like, which is a little trick, if there's a ceremony before the game, I think it favors the away team. I don't know why, but it's always been like that. I mean, you kind of know why the home team has to come out and watch if the away team can stay in the locker room. They don't care that much. It's, it's always about a home team player or an ex-player for that team. And it seems to, like, it seems to throw the timing of the start of the game off, which might be more of a deterrent for a home team. I'm not sure why, but that's a, a little trick of the trade that works. So I don't like motivation. Like, they need to win this game to make the playoffs. To me, that's overly put in the line. If they were good in the first place, they would need to make this, you know, to win a game. And a good team can win a game when they need to win a game more so than, than a mediocre team. Hazel, my dog wants to be on. <laughs> you can bring her on. <laughs> what about what about series history? So how the teams have matched up in the past. Do you ever look at series history? Is that another one that's just simply not worth it? or is Not it in baseball, but definitely in hockey. Some teams can put a stopper out there when they play at home and stop a good player because their fourth line can stop a good first line. And if that team is a one-line team, you might want to take note of that because in hockey it's different because the, the home team gets the last change so they can dictate the matchups, line A against line C from the other team. So sometimes you'll see that, you'll make a note of it like, boy, they really shut down McDavid and Dreisaitl when they were playing together. So they're going to probably have to make them play on different lines the next time they come because they know at, say, at San Jose they're going to get shut down. Um, so make a little note of that. But, you know, always write things down. Write your little notes even if they – because you won't remember them, you know, you, you know, like a month later when that matchup comes back. You, you know, I always write my injuries. I have the injuries for each game. I chart each game in the book and write the injuries underneath. Even if they're minor, as long as they're players who are regular players, 
you know, especially if like two defensemen are out, the number three and number four guy. That, that, that's much worse than one defenseman being out. Disrupts the chemistry of a line. It makes the second pairing play against a much tougher, tougher role for them. Um, you know, the checking, the, the, the conservative stay at home defensemen now can't stay at home because they're playing against better players. And little changes. Um, I think hockey is the most injury key sport. You know, baseball is obvious if a great player's out, the line's going to change. But in hockey, if two really good players are out, the line may just get neglected as long as your star players play. But that matters if you take a player from the second line and the third line. That that probably hurts. That probably isn't put into the, the line by the bookmakers enough. So there's little tricks, and each sport has a little trick. So I, I know, I have no clue how basketball works. Like, well, it's was too much work for me, and the NBA is like I, I, probably a lifelong thirty-seven percent better when I try to. <laughs> yeah, basketball is a different handicap for sure. I mean, going back to like you know motivation, series history, some of these factors, I think. Even chemistry, I think they play up more in, in the team, more of a team. You know, you know NBA, for me, like I've – or sorry, college basketball, for me, I've found a lot of, like, series histories that are really one-sided as far as the pace or tempo of the game because you have two teams with contrasting styles. One team plays, you know, maybe full-court press. or team plays zone. And you put them together, and it, it just one team's able to impose its will consistently game after game, maybe the last eight games in the series. I've gone under by an average of 15 points because just one team's superior at, at putting their style out there and stopping the other team from executing theirs. And motivation, things like that. I think in basketball, I think it's probably a little bit overrated, I would say, on the whole. I mean, team, let's say a team lost in the NBA to a team a week ago, lost by 25. If it's more recent, I think it matters more. But if it was two months ago, I just don't think it, it matters anymore. I think teams kind of forget and – the NBA is a sport where teams take nights off sometimes. They're not always giving 100. percent That might have been a game that they just didn't take seriously, so they don't, you know. The and they have come off a big win against the top team the night before, and then they're playing a mediocre team. That's the letdown thing. That's the only thing I'll give. I, I don't think motivation was, oh, you didn't beat uh, Minnesota by 10 the last time they were in Minnesota, and now Minnesota's going to be up, up for this game more. And, why would Houston not be playing the same way they played the first time? And I always think teams without, with no injury or no rest should be playing their best and not against the really worst teams in the NBA where, you know, where a team is a 14-point favorite. A lot of times you'll see the first half and those games be closer and then because they're confident they'll blow them away in the second half. What about the market? So if you've got some ratings on teams that are pretty far off from the market, do you – Dig in and look at those teams a little more. Are you just very confident with your numbers? How do you kind of approach when the market's telling you something on a team you know for the last four or five games, your rating's been way different than what the market's put out there? Yeah, because I put more into the last four or five games than the market. So I'm not surprised when that comes up. Um, yeah, it takes a while to see for the market to make the adjustment in hockey. I can see five good games with the team might have gone two and three or three and two in those games. And that's kind of where they were in the regular season, a 500 team. But I know they've gotten better. I know maybe they got a player back or maybe they just got better. What about and, baseball? You know, Obviously, pitcher is baseball's hard. Um, in baseball, I pretty much looked to bet against what everybody else would be doing and jacking up the line. Um, I like to bet underdogs in baseball if, if I had my choice. Um, I respect big favorites. But most people don't want to bet big favorites, but I'm willing to bet big favorites. Big favorites, small underdogs is fine with me, you know, looking for those value means because nobody like if St. Louis is playing Pittsburgh and St. Louis has a good pitcher, but they're at Pittsburgh and they're 25 and it looks like, oh, St. Louis is a good team. Pittsburgh is a pretty bad team. You know, that's when you don't want to lay the 25. I think that, that line, line looks tempting. All they have to do is win, and you're not really risking that much. But I think in those situations, those teams would be much more likely to be like 10 or 15. Um, so I, I think the, when you bet small, when you bet small favorites, especially on the road, it, that usually translates to trouble. It's just one of the things I avoid. It's not, you know, um, a lot of times, 
I'll find a good situation to bet those small favorites. It's not something I don't like want to do, but I think if I looked over the whole season, my, my records of laying 10 to 30 would always be worse than other other bracket, other statistics based on the line, the closing line. And it's, for, for me, it's important to beat the closing line, whether you do it by following a move or do it by feel. I like to bet either first or last, taking against the move last and on the, you know, anticipating the move first. So for baseball, are you keeping a separate rating for every starting pitcher then? Do you have like a, a hard rating? Well, I, I'll do it by feel. Uh, you know, like I'll look at velocity and, and spin rate and see if somebody's improving. Uh, if there's a history with the team, if the pitcher's been around a while, I'll look at the batter versus pitcher ratings and go, you know, it, it, kind of overrated, but not overrated if they've been facing them 30 or 40 times. You'll see a lot of four for sevens and I, I – who knows what those singles were? Um, I'm baseball is more. I'm a total sky more in baseball. You know, I, I heard I heard Captain Jack talk about barometric pressure, something I used when he was using it too. I'm still with it more than he is. I know it's in the line more now, but it was such a good thing then. It's still like a kind of a good thing now. I think, um, you know, temperature, humidity, barometric pressure—they're all kind of related. But lineups will help. Um, trying to one of the things I do in baseball, I think you do it too, is am I better off betting five innings here or nine? How's my bullpen? Are they tired? I don't want to bet them in a nine inning game. Are they rested? The other team's tired, but now the bullpen edge is mine, so I want to bet them that team in a in a nine inning game, you know, instead of a five. Now when they're going to have the starting pitcher stuff with the one inning, that that takes a little bit away from you know. It takes away from a lot of things. It, it makes it really hard. I, mean, I kind of throw that inning out and hope it doesn't change, you know, that nothing really is accomplished. Uh, and then I'll base it on who's going to pitch the second to the seventh inning. So. so what would you say overall, it's taking a step back and get your overall approach for sports betting. What percentage, I mean, I think you have like a lot of feel and just experience you're baking into it. What percentage do you think is numbers based? What percentage is more your feel and intuition about just knowing the teams? 70, 30 to knowing, you know, numbers based and intuition. Intuition can get you in trouble. Um, you know, visual, visual perception should align with numeric you know, calculations. That's when you're stronger. I, I think this team is playing good. There are number the expected goals go my way. The, the goalie is the right goalie in the situation where I wanted it. It's, a lot of times that's a backup goalie. I want a backup goalie because the lines, I think, are a little over-adjusted to backup goalies, uh, especially when they're playing well. A lot of times in October, your backup goalie becomes your starter by December. Um, so be aware of that. I'm a seasonal. As the season progresses, I change things up a little. As the season progresses, and in baseball, I, I like to bet the totals in, in May and June when the weather changes. Um, in, in hockey, I I don't like to bet right out of the box. You know, getting my power rating started is very dangerous to believe in them at all because you can be way wrong because basically you're doing it on what happened last year and the adjustments to the players this year. Exhibition almost means nothing in hockey because they never really, the starters rarely play. And it'll be different now. Who knows what the, coming back from the virus stuff. Uh, I'm not going to be firing right away. I don't think there's that many edges. I want to see things playing in, in an empty arena. I don't know if it's going to be in the same arena. You know, maybe they'll use three different arenas to play. There's a whole lot to wait for. So Do you I'm, think not, I'm dying for sports to come back, but I'm not dying to start firing at it. Do you think that the NHL will play the playoffs? Do you, you have a, an inkling of whether that will happen or not? Well, somebody sent me an article from Larry Brooks, um, and he said a team is going to start practicing May 15th with the expectation of coming back. I wouldn't take that to the bank. Um, we have still have two and a half weeks to see if uh, the states open up and they spike or not. I don't know if every player wants to be in quarantine. I don't know what the quarantine will entail. There's a whole lot of things. How much time uh, would they need to get ready? Would they need three or four weeks to get ready, you think, or less? 
No, the three or four weeks is now until May 15th to see what's going on when Georgia opens up. I mean, I mean the players, they get back in shape. I mean, they need a few weeks, right? Yeah, I think maybe, you know, two weeks. You know, remember, hockey can play 12, 10 games in two weeks, but I don't think they need a whole exhibition season. I, hopefully, most of them are trying to stay in shape because they were expecting the season to resume somewhere down the line. Yeah, and baseball is going to be really crazy, I feel like, because if they, they play the whole thing in, you know, a couple of different stadiums. They're talking about Texas, talking about Arizona, uh, Florida. I mean, they're going to have to play in domes, I would imagine, because it gets hot in the summer in those in those areas. Yeah. If you don't have domes, that's going to be a huge factor in the game, I feel like. Um, well, the, new, the new Ranger Stadium's a dome, right? Yeah, yeah, they got a dome. And, you know, the players – it seems like in baseball more so just from what I've been reading that there's a lot of players that said they, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't be in quarantine for four or five. Some players got you know, their wives, Mike Trout's wife's pregnant. He doesn't miss the birth of his child. So what are they going to do? I mean, let him go for, you know, a few days and come back. Probably not. Yeah. So, you know, what are they going to do with that? It's going to be a chaotic mess. And I, I'll, I'll take it as a bonus. If we have it, I, I think we're not going to see baseball for some reason. And baseball's probably got the most to lose because every other sports only going to miss part of their season. I mean, NBA, we had, you know, 80% of the regular season. College basketball, we got almost the entire season. Hockey, we got almost the entire regular season. Baseball is the only sport that could lose literally the entire season. They're not a shortened baseball season where they know maybe they Maybe 90 know. games or something, maybe. But They can play every day, so you can play 60 games in two months. And they said maybe double headers too, like once a week, which sure. you could have more games. Seven inning double headers, by the way, which would be kind of crazy. Yeah, I mean, just give us sports, you know, not because we want to bet them, but we want to watch them. You know, it gets boring. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we definitely want to bet. We, I can't imagine the take in this draft today, you know, the betting take in the draft. I listen to Beeson, and any time I turned it on, they were talking about bets in the draft. Bets in the draft. All right, we, we got some questions coming in here, and I want to make sure we, we get Let me to give a shout-out to Stephen and Ethan Skelly. I told them I would. There's your shout-out. Right. Okay. All right, cool. Um, all right, so this one's kind of long here, so – uh, let's see. When I play horses, I narrow the field down. This is a horse betting, horse betting question, which we haven't talked about yet. I narrow the field down at the contenders, and I sign a line. I look at the odds of any horse, see if it's an overlay, and I bet to win. Is there a team sport betting? Is there a sport? Is there a team sport betting where I can know if there's a choice of an overlay is a good value? Now, so I think it's trying to equate horse betting to sports to figure out if you can do it. You can't do that for the reason that you don't know what you're getting with sports betting. Um, I'm sorry, with horse betting, you unless you bet right in post, you don't have any idea your odds. Today I bet a horse at Gulfstream, and he was 7-2 to two with no minutes to post. And I knew it was coming because Safi Joseph is a trainer that gets that. And he went in the gate at 7-2, out of the gate at 9-5. to five. And I knew he was going to run. I didn't know if he was going to win. He did happen to win. But, you know, I wouldn't have bet him at 9-5. to five. But in baseball, you freeze. You know, in all sports – you freeze the number that you bet it at. So make a line, look for value. Um, you can't throw out bad baseball teams. That's not, that won't work for you. Like I'm never going to bet Kansas City this year. That, that's not a good way of deal. The team that will be the worst team for the season will be a team that was expected to be a good team. And you notice they're not that good right away. And that they'll, they'll play 500, but they were rated as a top five team. And, and you know, that's, that team will have the most money lost if you wager them every time. So it will rarely be the worst team. And getting the worst team right is a little hard because there are a lot of bottom feeders in baseball now. It's, it's value, yes. You have to look for value. Your line against is the same thing as your uh, what you expect the horse to be. Here's a good bet at four to one. Oh, he's two to one. I don't want to bet him. Oh, there's another horse that's right to seven to one. I thought he'd be three to one. I'm going to bet him. In, in, these are in sports. You make a line 40 and the line comes up 60, you're going to take 50. That's pretty much a little more cut and dry in sports betting. Yeah. Um, what about luck? So, this the question is saying how do you decipher between what is luck and a team just being good? How do you kind of separate the two? Statistics luck would be a team that, you know, didn't have the higher expected goals, um, scored late and won in overtime. Baseball is hard because there's a lot of luck in baseball. Line drives being double plays and line drives being doubles are very 
you know, a foot, a foot away. But you can tell when a team in baseball or basketball or football did not win because of luck. Hockey's a little different. Hockey, you're, you want the score to be misleading. You're looking for misleading scores. And football, too. First week of football, minus 137, nothing like five years ago. And then they lost eight games in a row. And if you watch that one game, oh, the Niners are much better than everybody thought. And then they were not. So I, that's one of the things in football. I think look for the first week and then bet against what you saw. Like it's going to be overrated in the line. Yeah, so, I, uh, there's, you don't put too much – to, you know, too much at stake for one game. I and mean, one game, a lot of things can happen, and teams right. can be you know off their game for that one game, or maybe play way above their head for one game, and right. it doesn't really tell you. You need you need a few games to really know for sure. So you don't want to overreact early on in the season. Yeah, once you see a team that you go, oh, this team is terrible, that's a good time to bet. Yep. Because your perception is usually too strong, and so is the line maker's perception being too strong. So we have a question here asking how to spell Corsi. So it's C O R S I. For Corsi, um, you can look that up, and they keep that. What's what sites do you go to get your Corsi numbers at? I think Corsica.com. Corsica.com. Okay, and they have a situation adjusted, right? Yes, you can do tie game one within one goal. Put it, break it down to periods. Corsi is real. That that Corsica site is really good for me. It works. It has everything I need. Yeah, that's a great site. That's been there. And then use your bloggers. Bloggers are important. Not the home team newspaper people. The bloggers are important because they'll be more critical. We've got somebody here asking you for your betting action. How much of it is pregame versus live bets? 95% is pregame. I can't count on live bets because when by the time I process what I have there and, and I try to bet it, it's moved one way or another and usually against me. Like, oh, I'm looking at late 20, now it's 27. Uh, late 27 for a little bit less. Now it's 29. And you're, ah. You know, there's a, there's a lot of those. So you miss a lot of the good bets and you might make the get the best that you saw the wrong way against the market. Like, oh, I'm going to lay 20 here. Oh, it's 15. Oh, oh unbelievable. Well, it, it'll close 10 and you have the worst of it. Uh, so it's a little dangerous. I, I don't like live betting. I'm, I know it's a wave of the future. Um, I don't mind doing it at halftime. I don't mind doing it at quarters. I don't like doing it at commercial. Yeah, another thing. Another too, thing is very delayed. So, you know, by the time you get your bet in, that game might have started, and in five seconds, I'm done by it. So. You get denied so often. I mean, the thing will just spin for a while, and then you know, the play happens. In places are terrible. If it goes against you. You get the bet. If it goes for you, you don't get the bet. A lot of times, you know. You're doing William Hill, and, and you're doing it while the game's going on. You you got the worst. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a question about your approach, Dink. So. He's asking here, do you work with people that model hockey or how do you weigh your qualitative assessment versus a model? Are you using any kind of model with, or leaning out other people at all? Or is it all based on your own approach? It's based on my own approach. Hockey, I'm very confident that I, that I can do everything by myself and not model, with, not put in a model, but put in a, what's this worth in the line? Oh, you know, so-and-so is not playing goalie. Billington's not playing goalie. Allen's playing goalie. Well, Allen's been playing really good, so I'm not going to make that that move more than a few cents. And, you know, I'm a sportsbook might have it more than what, what I think. So now I'm lo looking to bet St. Louis. But maybe somebody's out for St. Louis, so I have to, un you know, buy, put that back into the line. So it's all little things to make a line. It's kind of a model, but it's not a true model. It's a... It's a mind model. It's my model of the way I think of each element and what it's worth toward the, towards the norm. Dink's mental model, as we can call it that. It's, it's, if you don't do that, I don't know how you can do sports, either a mental model or a real model. Right. You got to have some kind of process. If you're just willing yeah, to. Yeah, that's eat. a big process where you come up with a line. Yeah, you got to have I, a I, In hockey, I'm fine because I'll beat the line, you know, pretty much consistently. I'll All right, what the, about. The biggest weaknesses in the lines, are they in derivatives? Are they in like first five innings, first period? Or do you think that there's more value in the, the full game size and totals? I like full game because you can probably lay 12 or take 10 somewhere down the line. I, you can't do that in the first five innings. Where, so you have a bigger big against you in the first five innings a lot of times. One That's of the, the things the first five, five innings that I do like or, or the first periods in hockey is the streaks are overrated. You know, uh, they've, they've gone over the first 
period, seven times out of the last eight, that's really in the line. That's really pushed in the line. And it's kind of random because the totals are one or two, one, one and a half or two, one, one and a half or two. And then you're, you're dealing with a very small, you know, what am, I, what am I trying to say? You're dealing with a very small um, variance, one great, one great save or one hit somebody in the head and went in the net will determine your first period. There was a lot more luck involved in a first period wager versus the yeah, whole. Yeah. yeah. I don't like betting the first team to 10 in an NBA. I think that's ridiculous. You know? yeah. A lot yeah. of luck. There's yeah. enough time for the game to play out. Yep. Uh, here's a question here about uh, someone who has a book that inflates all of their NHL favorites up 10 cents better than what Penny is offering. Can I blindly take anything 10 cents better than Penny is offering? You mean like Penny, you can lay 20, but they have it 30, so you can take 10? No, that would be close to a break-even bet. So you should pick and choose by, by making your own line where it's, 10 cents isn't enough, uh, especially the smaller, with Penny. Though, the smaller Penny probably is, right? Every, every sports book should be 5 cents higher than Penny because Penny has a 12-cent line and they have a 20-cent line. So already it, it's something going to be higher. But what are you laying on like a, a game that's pick 'em? What are they what's their line on pick 'em for hockey? So their 05, 05, or 04, 04 would be 14 minus 06 on the other side. So that in that case, you could take the 10 cents better because the VIG at that lower end of the spectrum is less, right? Yeah, but you're laying 06, you could lay 04 a penny probably if it's 10 cents back. I think he's saying, though, he's getting 10 cents better than what Penny is. Than the, he could get 10 cents better on the dog that Penny's dog is. That's different. If the favorite is higher, but the biggest 20 cents in, in, in his book, it's, it's not that big an edge. But if you can, lay, if you can take 20 at Pinnacle, but you can take 30 at your, at your um, whatever bookmaker you have, that's a break-even bet blindly. And if you can handicap that a little bit better, that should make you a winner. Right. Yeah, it all depends on where that – where he, is he coming off to the, the dog or the – What's the dog bet? You know, what the favorite is doesn't matter because you're not betting the favorite, but how, how much higher is it with the dog? Oh, he's, he's responding here. So he says, Penny will have plus 130, and I can take plus 140. That's okay. Bet. Yeah. <laughs> on blindly, you should break even with that at, that at worst, and if you're a good handicapper, you should make it work out and you'll have a problem. Yeah, that's a good uh, – that's a good book. I might have to – Reach out to this guy. <laughs> yeah. uh, Give me a call and we'll work it out. <laughs> so forwards or defensemen in hockey, which has a bigger effect on your ratings? Defensemen, for sure. That's By very, far. Very underrated. Defensemen are the most important players in hockey. So what's what like an average, a guy's out, what's an average defenseman worth versus an average forward? Just the average player right in the middle. Second line of a second or third line forward or a second and third pairing defenseman. Uh, defenseman will play more time. And um, I'd say five cents for the defenseman and three cents for the forward. Okay. That's Does that idea. make sense to you, Eric? I'm doing that off my head. Yeah, I mean, it obviously depends on the depth of the team a little bit and who's going to sure. come and replace them, which you have to factor in. But, yeah, on average, yeah, that sounds – Reasonable. Your fourth and fifth defenseman might not be that good because your first your first pairing is unbelievably good. It depends. Yep. yep. Almost everything in sports is the answer is it depends. Another question about hockey here. How important are the goalies to your line? Overrated. Goalies are overrated. Now this, the backup goalies are pretty close to the starting goalies. It's not like it was 30 years ago when, you know, I don't want to mention a goal. You know, Villamure and Jockerman on the Rangers at 40 years ago, Villamure was far from the Jockerman. You know, the same percentages were much lower, but you know, but they were the gap between the number one goalie save percentage and number two was incredibly higher than it is today. Goalie coaches have changed the game. That's why the hockey toes are now five and a half instead of eight and a half. All right, so we got one or two more here. Um, what is your process? This is kind of a vague question, but we'll try to attack it. What's your process for actually getting money down? How much do I need to bet or where I bet? I think it's just logistics. Like, are you betting, like, you know? Usually Chris Vegas, comes up first and then Penny comes up second, and that's when I have to bet both. Um, total or not, I'm going to lose the line. 
Chris, everybody that kind of lets Chris settle and maybe another place will copy Chris, then Penny will come up with a reduced line. And I want to bet Chris because their limits are higher and Penny at the same time. Um, and at the end of it, you know, when I'm betting late because I'm betting against the move, I'll just price shop carefully, pick it, whatever I can get at, at a good number. So I'll bet 300 on a game. It's like one sports book in town is giving me seven cents more than the, you know, the next highest line because, but they only take 300. So I'll, I'll just take what I can get. There's always a dilemma, I think, with betters. Like, you, you know, you can obviously, if you want to get the best number, you want to react as fast as you can overnight, right when it comes out, bet it. But if you want to get more down, let's say you're trying to get a bigger bet down, you can wait it up, but then you might get five, 10 cents worse line. And now all of a sudden it's not really that big of a bet anymore. <laughs> The college football market is different because you have to attack that at the first place. I don't think it's going to move. There's a lot of people attacking it. You have to attack with them, or you're going to miss a, you know, a half a point to a point and a half on games. I know when you were when you were doing college like that, you know, I wanted to try to get what you want. You were getting because you were laying four in the line with close five and a half consistently. Um, I can't wait till a lot of people open the five because other people laid four and four and a half. Right. Other people right. jump in. I was you would lay four. I wanted to lay four and a half because I anticipated that would still be the close. Yeah. yeah. It definitely differs by sport a, a little bit. Right. One more question here, and then we'll let everybody watch the uh, the NFL draft here, which is starting. Uh, were you early or late to the first period overs run in the NHL last year? Did you get take part in that at all? Or were you? I was late. I didn't, I mean, I thought that. I mean, I, I bet a lot of overs in the NFL and the NHL last year, but I didn't. Uh, I think Tampa was the team that would always score late and get to two after the first period. They had like, and Beeson was big on it. That was 17 games in a row. I go, start at minus 30, is now minus 210. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. it, wasn't, it wasn't known, but it kept winning. So you can't knock the people who did it, but that's not my style. And like, when that's out and on the radio, it's, you know, all, and they got everybody's saying, this run is like nine out of the last 10 of this, nine out of the last 10 of that. I'm usually looking to bet the other side. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, we've got a couple more coming in. I'll, I'll answer the rest of these tomorrow on Twitter. Maybe you can jump in with me and answer a couple of these. I appreciate all your time. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for, for coming out here on a sports betting education. Um, hopefully we can do something like this again uh, sometime in the future. That's great. And uh, we'll be back on Tuesday at the regular time, 5 p.m. Pacific with pro better and former bookmaker Matt Lindeman. So see you guys then. Enjoy the draft. Bye, guys.